Now, I want you to turn with me to the Word of God this morning, please, and we're turning to the book of Esther. And we're turning to Esther chapter 4. Now, if you go to the very middle of your Bible, you come to the book of Psalms, and then the book before Psalms is Job, and then the book before Job is the book of Esther. And we're in Esther chapter 4, please. And we're going to take time to read the chapter just so we can get the picture into our minds before we come to the message. Verse 1, when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter cry. And came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was a great mourning among the Jews, and fasting and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and in ashes. And so Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. And then was the queen exceedingly grieved. And she went and she sent Raymond to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for Hetokan, one of the king's chamberlains, who made appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hetok went forth to Mordecai onto the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him, and, the, and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also he gave him a copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther, and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him, and to make request before him for her people. And Hata came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Again Esther spake unto Hata, and gave him commandment unto Mordecai, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know, that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come in unto the king into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such as to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty days. And they told Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer, and go gather together all the Jews that are, that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go on in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. And so Mordecai went his way and did, according to all that Esther had commanded him. And we know that the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his own precious truth. Now, child of God this morning, what does it take? What does it take this morning for God to bless? And what does it take this morning for God to move in our day and in our generation? That's the question 
that God put in front of me this week. What does it take for God to bless and for God to move in our day and generation? You may say to me, well, George, it takes prayer. Of course it takes prayer for God to bless. And of course it takes prayer for God to move. What does it say in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14? It says there, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. Do you know that's the first thing God's people has to do before they even pray? God's people has to learn to humble themselves. Do you know what I think is wrong with God's people today? They're riddled with pride. And if God's people has anything to do before the pray, friends, it's humble. It's to humble ourselves. And I think that's what's greatly needed for God to move today. God's people needs to humble themselves. And God's people today are riddled with pride, spiritual pride, material pride, and whatever pride goes. You know what God says in Proverbs 16 and 5? Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Do you see if you're proud in heart, child of God, it's the same degree in God's sight as witchcraft. Pride in a man's heart is as much an abomination as using charms. And that's, friend, how what God thinks of pride. And I believe, friends, that's what needs to take place in my heart and everybody else's heart. We need to get rid of pride. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves, and pray, and seek my face. There's more to seek in God's face than just saying prayers. When one seeks God's face, they're desperate for God to move. You desperate this morning, child of God, for God to move in our generation and in our day. For I'll tell you, we're coming down with missions. We're coming down with preachers. It'll take more than missions. It'll take more than preaching. It needs a move of God, friends. That's what we need today, in our day and generation. What we need is a move of God, friends. A move of God. Because that's what's going to take to turn the tide back again. Move of God. And then that wee verse in Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse, verse 14 says also, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. God's people need to turn away from wicked ways. If God's people wants to see blessing, and God's people wants to see God move. We need to get rid of the wicked things, friend, that we're practicing, such as backbiting and fighting and talking about people. I'll tell you, there'll be no blessing if people talks and backbiting and bickering. I'll tell you, friend, that's what it takes for God to move. And that's what it takes for God to bless. Ah, but it takes more than taking, friends. It takes to give. It's not what it takes, friends. It's what's given. What, did God, what does the Lord say in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10? Do you know what God said in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10? Bring ye all the tithes, he says. All the tithes. Not some of the tithes, or most of the tithes, all the tithes. Bring ye and all the tithes into my storehouse. 
that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now, God says herewith, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there be not room enough to receive it. God wants to bless, friends. And God wants to move. Listen, is that not what we long for? For God to pour a blessing upon us. For God to move upon us. That we can't even have room enough to, be, to receive it. Because I'll tell you something, child of God, that's what's needed. That's what's needed. What's needed today is a move of God and the blessing of God. And it's not only what we want. It's what God wants. Here in Esther chapter 4, we find a desperate day. A desperate day, friends. We find a dark day. And I'm telling you this, and it's all down to one and what they give in order to save the day. It's about this wee lassie called Esther. And it's all about what she's going and what she's prepared to give that is going to save the day. She had to realize, friend, that she had to give God her all for the sake of her people and for the sake of the Jews. And the wee title I have placed upon this message this morning is this one, Laying Your Life on the Line for God. Now, that's what I call giving your all. Tell me this, child of God, through these lips of clay, God wants to ask you this question. What are you prepared to give for God to move? What are you prepared to give for God to bless? It takes more than prayer. It takes God's people to give themselves. Are you prepared to give God your all? I want you to first of all think about this this morning. Think of the circumstances. Think of the circumstances that was facing her. Let's get to grips with this this morning. All her people. In chapter 3 and verse 13, you'll read it for yourself. All her people. The Jews, both young and old, little children and women, were to be destroyed in one day. And listen, child of God, the king signed the decree that it would happen. And once the king signed the decree that it would happen, it would have to happen. And you know what it would be, friend? It would take a miracle to reverse it. I want to tell you, child of, child of God, something this morning. Listen, it takes a miracle for God to move. For with men it is impossible, but for with God it is possible. Thank God it's possible. And the Jews were facing this tidal wave, a tidal wave of terror that seemed to be unbreakable, unstoppable. And you know what happened to Esther? She was awakened to the great need. The great need that surrounded her. The great need that faced the future of her people. And the future of her people, it hung on the balance. Oh, child of God, tell me this this morning. Are you awakened to the need of your family members that are not saved yet? 
There's a great wave of terror that's about to break upon them. If they die, they're going to the flames of hell. If the Lord, if the Lord was to return the day, return the day, child of God, we'd be taken and they would be left to face the tidal wave of the seven-year tribulation. Child of God, let's all be awakened this morning to the great terror that awaits those of our family, those of our friends, those of our neighbors who are without Christ. Do you see if the Lord come back this morning or come back today and these unsaved family members and unsaved friends and they're left behind to face the tribulation, where will you and I be? In heaven, playing a harp? No, we'll be in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ giving an account of what we have done to win others and to save others. As once the rapture happens, and it could happen today, and the Lord could come today. The first appointment we have with the Lord Jesus Christ is at the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of what we have done for Him on this earth. There's too many Christians in the heaven of clue. They think they'll go to heaven playing some harp. You'll be before the judgment seat of Christ giving an account of how you spent your life. Listen, child of God, do you see that wee neighbor across the hedge? Do you see that old mother, father, son, daughter? Listen, I'm going to tell you something now. Their eternal future hangs in the balance. And what are you doing to see this morning, child of God? Listen, what are you doing to win them? What are you doing to stop the tidal wave of judgment that's going to come upon them? And too many, too many let them go. And too many Christians didn't bother their heads in days gone by until the moment came and they passed away and they stood at the edge of the coffin and with regret they cried upon their, on their lifeless face and said, I wish I told you. I wish I told you. And too many has lived with the regret of not saying anything. She was awakened by the great circumstances that faced her. I'll tell you this concerning her people. I'll tell you, child of God, we need to be awakened about our loved ones. I'll tell you what's wrong today, child of God. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. You know, the great problem today is it's the greatest curse within the church. Proverbs 28, verse 19 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. I'll tell you something now, child of God. There is no vision today in pulpits. The main problem today is this. There is no vision in pulpits. The men preach today just to get their half hour in. I don't know how many funerals I've been till in January. I've lost count of them. January. And they've turned funerals now. They've turned funerals into a This Is Your Life program. Paying tributes. But they won't preach the truth. I've been called, and if I have a funeral to do, I'll pay tribute. But my calling is never to pay tribute. My calling is to preach the truth. And there's no vision in pulpits today. Men are more interested in their salaries. Men are more interested in their packages. Men are more interested in this. And men are more interested in the other thing. And there's no vision. And I'll tell you this, there's no vision in the pulpits. And God help them when they stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And I'll tell you another thing, there's no vision in the pew either. That's a big problem too. There's nobody today out to seek people to bring them in under the gospel, the message of the gospel on a Sunday evening. 
If we had the right vision, this place should be packed on a Sunday night. Listen, I'm only sharing with you what the Lord shares, told me to share, and I'm saying it with all the love in my heart, and sure love every one of us. And you know that. You know that. Of course you know it. But friend, listen to me. Isn't it true? If we had the proper vision, this place would be packed on a Sunday night. Bringing others with us. And as long as the Lord has me in Kilkeel, I'll be preaching the gospel on Sunday night, and you'll be without excuse because I will preach the gospel. I'll do my bit. But you, the believers, child of God, needs to be doing your bit. As long as the Lord has me in this pulpit, I'll have the gospel preached here every Sunday night for you. While in other places of the world, there's people getting killed tonight, this morning. People getting killed. Trying to reach people for Christ. People in other parts of the world are getting killed. Of telling others about Christ. And child of God, I say this with all the love in my heart, and you know I love you. Where are you on a Sunday night? Never mind not bringing an unsafe friend with you. Where are you? My friends, listen, I'm saying this this, this morning with all the love, and I know you know that. But we all here this morning have a responsibility in winning others to Christ. And I want you to notice the calling that was forcing her. Verse 8 there in our Scripture reading, it says there that, Tell Esther to go in and to go in to the king and make supplication unto him and to make request before him and for her people. And you know, the charge was to go in. You know, God had her in a place. God had her in a position to save the day. Listen, child of God. God has you in that place, that workplace. God has you in that family. God has you in that neighborhood to reach them and to tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. You may say to me, well, George, listen, it's somebody else. No, no, no. No, 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 friend. It's you. You may say to me, but George, I feel inadequate. I don't feel worthy. Listen, you're the very instrument God wants. God takes up the person who doesn't feel inadequate, and God uses the person who doesn't feel worthy. You know why? Because pride is not there. God can't use somebody that's pray proud. I'm telling you this, child of God. Moses felt inadequate, but he was the one God used to deliver his people from the land of Egypt. Think of Gideon this morning. Gideon was the one who God used to defeat the Midianites. Think of the widow of Zarephath, who God used to sustain Elijah. Think of the wee lad, the wee lad this morning, that God used to feed five thousands. Listen, God stepped in, but they had to give their all first. Moses had to give himself before God could bring them out of Egypt. Gideon had to give himself to defeat the, the, the Midianites. Friend, the wee widow of Zarephath, she had to give all that she had in order to sustain, to sustain Elijah. And listen, the wee lad had to give all the loaves and the fish over, over for the Lord to bless the people. And listen, child of God, God demands that you and I give our all in order for God to move. You know what my text is this morning? I haven't even announced it yet. It's the last line in verse 16. If I perish, I perish. Do you know, friends, we pray for revival, but very few of us are stepping up to the mark to pay for revival. You know, child of God, you may say to me this morning, but George, I'm only one. But listen, you're the one God could use. Wonder this morning, has God burdened you with a person to go and speak to them? God has placed some person upon your heart to go and tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. God has placed them upon your heart. You can't get that person out of your mind. God wants you 
this morning to go to. But there was the consequence that was fearing her because if Esther went in unto the king, there was a chance she was going to die. Unless the king had given out, leaned over the scepter, and she, and she was invited, she had access, but if he didn't, it was death for her. But you know, child of God, desperate moments takes desperate measures, and the never-dying soul of your family member or the never-dying soul of your friend is desperate measure. For the sake of her people, Esther led her life on the line. Are you afraid this morning? Are you afraid? Esther had every reason to be afraid. Are you afraid? You're afraid of what that person may think of you after you tell them. You're afraid perhaps what that person may say. Esther was afraid. But she had a choice to make. And her faithfulness outweighed her fear. You know, child of God, this morning, the cause outweighed the cause. Would it be a terrible tragedy this morning, child of God, if this was the last Lord's Day morning before the Lord would come? And I wonder this morning, child of God, how many people have you invited to the fishermen's service even this evening? There's something wrong, child of God, if you have never had the vision or the burden to ask someone there's something badly wrong. The cause is great. Finally, you've got the circumstances that were facing her. You've got the calling that was forcing her. You've got the consequences that was fearing her. You've got the climax that favored her. Esther led her life on the line. She faced certain death for the sake of her people. And because she led her life on the line, God moved in a way thought impossible. God moved in a way thought impossible. And I can tell you what God did in Esther's day, God can do in our day. And I believe that. But child of God, we need to be prepared to pay the price. A text message landed on my phone this morning. A story to confirm the message. Believe it or not. I was telling Tracy this morning, but I says, I'm not going to tell you the story to spoil it. Over 150 years ago, two missionaries. Do you know what they've done? They sold themselves into slavery. They sold themselves into slavery for the purpose to reach and to win other slaves for Christ. As the boat left the shore, the two missionaries shouted to their friends and family, 
Oh, to the Lamb that was slain. May he through us in some small way receive the reward for his sufferings. And those two missionaries led their life on the line by selling themselves into slavery to win slaves and to win the slave master. And those two missionaries not only saw many slaves saved, but they saw a number of slave masters repenting and coming to Christ. Sold themselves into slavery to become slaves to reach other slaves with the gospel. Are you prepared to lay your life on the line? Am I? With only a short life. And I pray that every one of us, every one of us, when we appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and every one of us will appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and it will not matter how well you preached or prayed in the prayer meeting, it's how you serve the Lord and what you've done to win on her. I want to hear on that day, well done, good and faithful servant. You know by now George McConnell's not a man pleaser. I'm out to exalt the Savior and to please Christ my Lord and my Savior. On that day, I wonder, will there be stars in our crowns? May God bless this word and may we awaken to the desperate situation in our land and in our nation today. 405 in the Red Hymn Book is our closing hymn. I am thinking today of that beautiful land I shall reach when the sun goeth down, when though through wonderful grace by my Savior I stand, will there be any stars in my crown. 405, please, and we'll raise the sing. Thank you.